Okay, welcome to the PTL webinar series. Uh, these series evolved from sessions that were held by the PTLs regarding updates to their projects at each summit. And we've converted that format into webinars kind of to extend the reach of the events beyond the summit. And today, our PTLs are going to update you on what may be new for Juno, our next release, as well as detail any items of note for our users and operators. I'm Margie Caller with the Foundation. Allison Price is here as well from the Foundation. Um, and we are going to run the webinar. And um, today joining us as well are the three PTLs that will be presenting to you. Um, that will be Dolph Matthews, 1T. Uh, he's a PTL for Identity slash Keystone. Uh, and then we have Mark Washenberger from Image Service, codenamed Glance, and Ann Gentle from the Documentation Project. I don't know if there's a codename. Codename Docs. So um, everyone's line is muted. I'm going to start with Dolph, move to Mark, and then Ann. So Dolph, when you are ready, I am ready. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm Dolph Matthews, Program Technical Lead for OpenStack Identity. Um, hopefully today I'll be able to convey some of the more interesting directions that Keystone is heading uh, during Juno. Um, and several of these should be familiar as their ongoing themes from the past release or two. Uh, so during ISOPS, uh, the Identity Program established an official mission statement, so I wanted to take a minute and share that. Uh, especially if you're not familiar with the Identity Program in the Keystone Project. Um, so at the end of the day, our goal is basically to carry out as much of the burden, to carry as much of the burden uh, surrounding off in and off the as we can, uh, so that other projects don't have to do it themselves. Um, so we recognize that not every cloud has the same authentication requirements, and not every service has the same authorization requirements. Uh, so we made we've made portable solutions to both of those problems. Uh, we also advertise the services provided by the cloud to the end users. Uh, as a first step towards users being able to navigate and interact with the cloud. Uh, it's also worth noting that we're seeing more and more of a focus on auditing as a cross-project effort, but those contributors tend to come from Keystone's own community. Uh, so from a community perspective, we're very much edging towards uh, traditional triple A, not to be confused with triple O. Uh, so federated identity. Uh, so while Keystone itself can stand in for many deployments as an identity provider all by itself, uh, we've always recognized the need to uh, start federating out to existing external identity providers um, and abstract that away from the rest of OpenStack. So in IceHouse, we finally shipped an API extension called OS Federation, uh, which provides Keystone with the necessary plumbing to map externally verified uh, federated identity information into Keystone's existing model of multi-tenant authorization. Uh, so for external verification with SAML2, for example, which was the first use case we wanted to tackle during ICEHOUSE, uh, we currently depend on a popular Apache module called Shibboleth and that you deploy Keystone uh, on Apache, behind Apache, and everyone will get it. Uh, we're now looking to leverage that groundwork uh, to establish first class support for both OpenID and Kerberos during Juno. And we're also looking at approaches for allowing uh, one Keystone deployment to trust tokens issued by another, uh, which would basically mean that one or more remote Keystones could act as your local Keystone's IDP or IDPs. Uh, compressed PKI tokens. Uh, so for some quick background on this topic, especially if you're accustomed to UUID tokens, uh, PKI tokens are large Base64 encoded signed JSON objects containing identity, authorization, and audit data, uh, usually along with a catalog of accessible web services, the service catalog. Excuse me. Um, the varying size of PKI tokens tends to be alarming for users coming from older UUID deployments where tokens are just a constant 32 characters. Um, so it presents a little bit of a user experience issue, but the PKI tokens can be so large that they actually bump into uh, limitations in, for example, Apache. Um, so we're looking at different options to reduce the size of tokens, and compression just happens to be one of the first steps we're taking in that direction. Uh, so hopefully we'll see PKI tokens uh, continue to shrink over the next couple releases. Uh, it's also worth noting that you'll see this feature, see this feature referred to as PKI Z. I'm going to go back one slide. Uh, 
which is an odd underlying implementation in the fact that we're just adding uh, ZLIP based compression onto regular PKI tokens. Uh, so token revocation events. Uh, this was a big feature from ISOS that we landed, um, but we're not actually using it yet. Uh, so in prior releases, Keystone has published a token revocation list, um, and it still does, which is a giant list of revoked, revoked bearer tokens. Uh, so for example, if you're using PKI and you delete a domain, uh, we will generate a gigantic list of all the tokens attached to that domain that are now invalid, and then push that out to the other services. Uh, so that alone represents an attack vector. It's super chatty. Um, there's some network load there, and it's a big reason why we have to persist PKI tokens uh, to the database in the first place. Uh, so as I said in IceHouse, we now have a new approach for that, and instead we're publishing descriptions of the events that result in token verification rather than lists of the tokens that are revoked. Uh, so our next step during Juno is to start using that information uh, to validate tokens for other services. Um, so then the token navigation list basically becomes redundant. We can turn that off. Uh, we've also been slowly moving towards a model with completely non-persistent tokens uh, where deployers can opt to not persist PKI tokens at all. Um, so as a deployer, that means no more token table to fuss uh, with um, no more token flush command, no more cron jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Keystone's load and performance all improved. Um, that's it. Uh, and hierarchical multi tenancy. Um, so the biggest topic for last. Uh, the idea of hier hierarchical multi tenancy has uh, only been seriously floating around the community for a couple months now. Um, and if you followed along, you already know that Vish has a fantastic elevator pitch for the future, which I'm not going to try and replicate. But the short version is basically that we could potentially support in this organizational complexity for uh, resources and OpenStack um, tenants or projects, uh, rather than the relatively flat domain project multi-tenancy model that we have today. Um, so what one of the use cases we're looking at is resellers, for example. Um, we've seen some prototypal work already, and I expect that to continue throughout Juno. Um, but this is going to be such a dramatic change for OpenStack as a whole that I'm definitely not going to make any promises that he's going, is going to deliver anything during Juno. Um, and part of the reason why I say that is that it's an area where we have a laundry list of new use cases and security concerns and things we're looking at, and things that we need to better understand um, in order to actually support them uh, and implement them correctly. Um, so if you fall into either of those either of those categories, uh, we'd love to have your feedback. Um, that's all I really have. I don't see any questions in the chat, but I'll wait a minute. Otherwise, I will hand it off. Okay. People can ask at the end as well if you have any questions for Dolph. Thank you. Sure. And then Mark? I think I'll turn it over to you when you're ready. Mark with image service slash glance. Okay. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so thanks for the introduction, Marty. Again, I'm Mark Washenberger. I'm the PTL of the OpenStack Images program, and I'm here today to give you the Juno update for what we're working on. So for those of you who aren't um, maybe already very familiar with the images program, or again, the, the chief project in, in this program is coding Glant. Um, I've given you our, our current mission statement. Uh, we, we also, like the identity program, adopted our mission statement uh, somewhat recently. Um, and just to give you a sense, I mean, what we do is we, we focus on uh, bootable disk images, um, storing them, browsing them. Uh, making it so users can share them and, and manage them and distribute them uh, across the cloud. Uh, so a, a bootable disk image in this context is really something that, um, you know, say when a user shows up to Nova and wants to start a server, they're providing this disk, a reference to a disk image that lives somewhere in the um, So we're sort of the starting point for, for Nova instances. Um, the, the 
first thing I want to talk about today that's kind of on our list for Juno is that we're actually adopting a, a, a new mission. Uh, the, the idea is to kind of expand our scope somewhat to serve um, other projects. During the past two cycles, there's been some discussion about what kinds of opportunities are out there for different services such as heat, et cetera. Um, and so if we take a look at the next slide, um, you can see kind of a, a glimpse of our, our new mission, uh, sort of a trimmed down version. The, the main change is to no longer have a narrow focus on bootable disk images, but to focus on a, a broader category of objects that we're calling artifacts. Now this concept of artifacts does include bootable disk images, so we're not abandoning the, the story that we had before. We're just expanding, ex expanding it. Excuse me. And so let's talk a little bit about what, what an artifact is. It's a, it's a kind of generic concept. Um, it, it really can be kind of any, any sort of fixed data asset, something that's um, not, not immutable, strictly speaking, but any kind of change to it is a new version. Um, we, we focus on this versioning story because it's so important for the consumers of land. Um, there's kind of two chief use cases, people who want the latest thing every single time they go back to fetch it, um, say like the latest Ubuntu server, uh, the newest kernel patches, for example. But then you also have people who are serving mission critical uh, applications who have done extensive testing with a given resource and they won't be able to get the exact same version that they got yesterday. So we, we try to support both of those um, use cases and expand that out to artifact. Um, another one of the key attributes, oh, can we go back, sorry. Um, well, another one of the key attributes of an artifact is that it's strongly typed. We, we really want to make sure that people know exactly what they're getting and that there's a schema for what they're getting and that schema has description. Um, we're, we're trying to make sure that um, if, say, we're identifying an artifact as a bootable disk image, that you know it's going to be you know, one of this small set of, of fixed types of things, uh, just so that people know how to deal with it and so that uh, the operations on artifacts can be sensibly defined. And so while, again, this can be any kind of artifact uh, type, really, we're focusing on things for now that are consumed by OpenStack services. Um, so uh, on the next slide, I've got a few examples of what we're looking at. Again, disk images are artifacts. We, we also want to take the idea of a disk image and expand it out a little bit, still working with Nova, to describe more cleanly the concept of a device layout. So saying dev SDA maps to this device with this image, say dev SDB maps to this assembly drive, et cetera. Um, those kinds of concepts need a clean, clear representation grant so that people can reliably um, boot them in Nova. We also like the idea of expanding out to machine templates in case you want to use glance to describe things like um, complex NUMA arrangements or um, processor attributes. A lot of things that are living in F extra specs in flavors right now we think could become artifacts that could be linked to how you boot your instance. And then all that's a little pie in the sky. The, the thing that we're focusing on most aggressively in the Juno time frame is actually storing heat templates. Um, and, and that ties into something that I want to say about artifacts. Artifacts can be like disk images. They can be very large and essentially um, opaque uh, bits of data, uh, you know, gigabytes, say. Um, or they can be much smaller and very highly structured, things like, like the JSON or YAML document that goes into the strategy heat template. Um, so these are the examples that I, I have for you now. The truth is that we have several more that we're looking at for um, almost integrated OpenStack services, such as Milano packages. Um, there's some time with Solum, et cetera. Um, but you can read more about that on the list. Um, so the, the next item uh, that is some under discussion for Juno and, and looks like we're going to be able to deliver to some degree in Juno is something that we're calling the metadata catalog. Um, this idea of a metadata catalog actually comes from a, um, a pretty advanced proof of concept uh, that was demonstrated and, and presented at the Juno summit um, and was known as graffiti. Um, the, the basic idea um, I think we see on the next slide. The basic idea um, is that 
across OpenStack services, different resources have have continually used this idea of, of metadata, user metadata, um, and tags. Um, and this is a very free form concept. You basically can put any kind of metadata you want on a server or on even an image uh, or a flavor. Um, but with it being so freeform, however, it runs up against the fact that sometimes you need that freeform data to be just right, um, or, or at least somehow consistent across resources, in order to use it correctly, or in order for the service to pick up the significance of it correctly. So the idea um, that the graffiti people had was to create a service to track the applicable metadata and tags across those resources, and I think across the new artifacts that we're adding. Um, so that uh, in Horizon you can have a, a really great user experience where you're looking at a resource and you can see what kinds of metadata you can apply to it, and you can see what that would mean. Um, and I really encourage people who are interested in this to uh, take a look at some of the videos that have been put out by the graffiti team uh, to get a sense of what, what they're driving at. Um, and you can find links to that on the mailing list. Finally, in, in, in Icehouse and, and somewhat in Havana, we, we've been working on some of these asynchronous operations. Chiefly, we want to support the concept of image import and image export. Um, progress has been slow, or we're finally, I think, at a point where we can move ahead and, and really fully support these, these use cases. And this is something that is really important for OpenStack because I think it plays in directly to our ideas around interoperability across clouds. Um, sometimes today it's very hard to have an image that works in one cloud work in another cloud. And by working on import and export, we should be giving deployers and users the tools they need in order to ensure that an image that works in one place works in another place. So that's, that's our vision looking forward for, for Juno and what we'll, what we'll be working on. There's a lot more that goes into it, but those are sort of the big ticket items. Um, I'm not sure if there are any questions at this point, um, but I'm also happy to take questions at the end. Great, thank you. I don't see any questions right now. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. So, Anne, I'm going to pull your presentation up. Great, thanks. And then we can get going when you're ready. Alrighty, yeah, there is no code name for the documentation program. It's just docs. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, so um, right, I'm Ann Zennel. I'm the friendly documentarian you've probably seen on the mailing list in, uh, at the summit. And um, I actually had to look up how long has documentation had an official program. So we've had a program since July of 2013. And our mission um, is to provide documentation for core OpenStack projects. We kind of scope narrowly so that if we can uh, document integrated, that's awesome. But we also are here to coach all the projects to provide you know, tooling and processes and you know, just best practices for quality and accuracy and basically treat the docs like code. So that's our mission. And I'm going to walk through a little bit of what we did in Ice House and then also um, what's coming up in Juno. So what happened in Ice House? Well, we actually um, had nearly 200 docs contributors. And um, when there's 1,200 contributors total, I'd love to see more like 600 doc contributors. But you know what? I feel really good about the kind of progress we're making. And so this is just a list of the new things we were able to deliver in Ice House, a new automatically generated configuration reference. I think it probably documents over 6,000 options across all of the integrated projects. So that's pretty amazing. And that's probably the only way to keep up with all the configuration options. Um, we also added a new upgrade section. So um, that typically lagged really far behind. Uh, but now there is an upgrade section in the operations guide um, that's fully tested, um, both on Ubuntu and Red Hat. And so um, there's also in the work now an uh, upgrade from Havana to Ice House. So that's about the earliest um, we've ever been able to, to write upgrade notes um, accurately. Um, and then I don't know if you noticed the big flash of the summit, but we had um, 
an O'Reilly custom edit on our operations guide that we originally wrote with a book sprint. And so that was super exciting to you know, work with a developmental editor who had a lot of good suggestions on where to add, where to invest time and resources. Um, and also just a really great cleanup, new images all throughout that are very consistent and an index. So that's kind of exciting to a book nerd like myself. Um, we also added an SEK chapter to the user guide that got Python specific examples. And um, we're continuing to add to that. There's also a long um, reference listing that's in PDF. So if you need to get on a plane and look up API reference information, that's now possible. And then um, one of the great wins in the ISOS release had to be that install guide. Um, just getting an architecture that included Neutron all throughout, um, but also still embodies Nova Network. But let's people really try OpenStack from the standpoint of getting it on several, you know, a couple servers, kicking the tires, and knowing enough to make good decisions later. Uh, you know, we close a lot of bugs too. Um, we track doc bugs just like code defects, and you know, we we close nearly 400 doc bugs. So. I just have to give props to the team who, who makes all this stuff happen. And it's really starting to pay off. We had a, the first time the user survey reflected, um, and I mean, I tell you, I love the user survey because it really gives us the, the input that we need and, and sometimes a kick to um, try to reach the next level. And this time, they, someone even noted that we've seen the documentation improve significantly and others are holding it up as, as a model to strive for. So these are the kind of things we're thinking about and keeping on working on. So what's coming up in Juno? So what I did after the summit is I collected all my notes and sat on the airplane and wrote out a roadmap for all of the documents that we currently maintain. And I don't know if you've heard me say this before, but in OpenStack docs, we really want to document OpenStack. And so we document the integration. We document the points where people are trying to deploy and administer an entire cloud. So not just Nova, not just Swift. Um, and so that's what I'm going to walk through is, is these roadmaps. Um, I'm going to give you some information on a book sprint that's coming up. I'm going to talk about how we're re, um, kind of re-teaming the security guide and the training guides. And then also talk about how I want to keep improving the end user docs and how we might go about that. And then also um, developer.openstack.org. What can we, we, we deliver that last release? How can we continue to improve it? And then always circle back to API documentation. So, so let's go ahead and uh, you can go next to the roadmap slide next. So I kind of group, group our documentation into two categories, mostly by audience, right? So we have a set of admin and deployer docs. Um, and I tell you, the install guide has a brand new blueprint to really do a deep, deep consistency level output to get sample output everywhere, to get sample config files everywhere. And we actually made a decision at the summit to remove the OpenStack config command so that people could see this is actually what I'm editing in each of the config files instead of trying to hide it behind like a Credini um, configuration guidance. And you know, that's, that's a tough decision. And, and we've kind of walked around it for a while. But I was really proud of the team for sticking it out, having that decision done at the summit. And we still had to discuss more on the mailing list. But it just felt good to make a good decision about the install guides going forward. And Matt Kaplora has been doing amazing work in the last release and continues to do so in this release as well. And then I see Govain is on the line. Thank you so much. Uh, at the summit, we decided we wanted to show in the documentation which options have been renamed or which options are now deprecated in a particular release. And so he's been working already. Um, on a blueprint to get the configuration reference to show per project what has changed. And I think that's going to be a great addition. Um, that's a brand new guide, and now we're going to keep improving it in Juno. And then we have an admin user guide that shows not only the dashboard admin tasks, but also what you can do in the client um, tools. And so we're going to keep adding to that, how to monitor usage. Um, 
even more on quota management. It's already addressed in there some. And also, um, we're keeping an eye on the mailing list and, and going to try to add more examples of what people are asking for. And then we've also got some nice migration kind of um, information so that people understand what am I, you know, when I have to completely evacuate a host, what does that look like? And try to do a deeper dive in the administrative, you know, day to day. Well, I hope you don't have to evacuate a host day to day, but the, the kind of tasks that admins have on, on, on top of their minds, right? Um, now we also, confusingly enough, we also have a cloud admin guide. And so this is that giant guide that keeps getting added to over time. Um, and one of the things we're probably going to do is a blueprint to break out a networking admin guide because enough of it is just different enough from general cloud admin uh, work that um, we're going we're gonna to try to assign some resources to get some really awesome networking day-to-day, um, -day networking best practices, um, all geared around OpenStack. And so Lana Brindley is um, in Australia and working on a book like swarm kind of day um, after PyCon Australia. So that in August we can kind of get that book really on, on its feet. Um, but two others that I didn't mention, um, not that they don't have roadmaps, so that, that these are not ones we're necessarily focusing on greatly in Juno, but we also have a high availability guide and we have a virtual machine image guide, which both are very highly read, but I just don't think there's a ton more work to do this release, and we're trying to focus in other areas, um, especially towards users and people who consume um, like application developers. So yeah, we can go on to the roadmaps for the user guides. Um, so we have a giant CLI reference now, and it basically gathers all of the um, with Nova help command um, into one place so that you can have a big reference listing. Um, and I think even bringing all that together has helped us um, even log doc bugs about even um, what, what Nova network does and what, what the, dif the different listing of networks commands do. I think that's been really helpful. And I, what I'd like to see happen with it is we'll keep adding the integrating clients. Um, Trove was recently integrated and they were like, oh wow, our stuff's already in there. So sometimes we get those kind of um, quick wins where um, we're able to automate enough to get really, um, really useful information right away that's integrated with the rest of OpenStack. And the user guide, has, we've had a really interesting conversation on the mailing list, um, the developer mailing list, about what to do with the user guide next. Um, right now, they, um, it's in the Heat project, in the Heat repo, and they automate a lot of the template reference. So what we're trying to figure out is, is there a way for us to automate the template reference to get it into the user guide format, or should we actually move the user guide into a different format that, the, that would then enable um, make it easier for everyday developers to contribute to the user doc. So I think that is a really exciting um, aspect is I really want to start um, enabling more and more authors. And so a lot of the work I did pre-summit was um, trying to survey documentation people, trying to get a sense of what people actually prefer to author in, how we can make our tooling um, still deliver exactly the deliverables that everyone expects and the high quality that everyone expects while at the same time finding ways to enable more and more authors. So I really am going to try to figure that out. And you know, even this morning, uh, Gavin and I had a conversation about this early on. Um, what is the best answer? And, and so I think it's great that we're having these good conversations early on, um, early in the Juno release. So now those are the roadmaps for each um, document that we tend to think of as like end user or admin um, and deployers. But we're also going to work on a guide that has not really been written before in OpenStack. And that is a, an architecture or design guide um, at the production level. So what are some, what, how can we create a viable for OpenStack architects? How can we create even the, the, the deepest detail of how to configure a cloud to do particular things? You know, starting probably with use cases of we need to get this done in a business setting. Um, and Ken Lee has done an amazing job of um, organizing beforehand, um, gathering a team of authors who are ready to take on the challenge of writing a book in five days. And I'm just so um, impressed with the bravery and also just the knowledge that we're going to gather in this room 
it is really awesome, and, and VMware is hosting. This is going to happen July 7th through 11th. And probably literally a week or two afterwards, we should have this book ready to uh, download from the docs.opensec.org site. So this is very exciting, and I'm just really um, grateful that this team has, has collected and that Ken was able to put it all together. So thank you. And thank you to the Foundation for sponsoring this event. Um, we always bring in a um, book sprint facilitator, someone who's done these over and over again and, and did our operations guide and did our security guide. And so Adam Hyde um, is going to do that again for us. And we're just super pleased to – I just can't wait to see what comes of it. So Now another one that um, – on the next slide we're going to talk about some of the security guide updates. So um, Brian Payne and I met at the summit and he was one of the original authors of the sprint. Um, they had about a dozen people there. And so we're looking for ways to do updates for Ice House. And you know, there's, there's a few doc bugs logged against that book, but for the most part, man, it has stood this test of time. And he's had really good input from people saying, you know, this is this is how we, we do these things. Um, and I'm just super excited that they're gonna start to do updates. So we're looking for the separate team to to really be subject matter experts on the security guide itself. And then what we plan to do is the other tech security notes are currently published on the wiki, but ideally we'll be able to do a publishing process for those become an appendix on the OpenStack security guide so that you always have that reference immediately if you need it. And then another team we're standing up separately from CoreDocs is a training guide team. And so this team has done a lot of work um, to get different paths that people can take, an associate's guide, a developer's guide, and working through all of the various ways that you might walk up to OpenStack and seek how to learn OpenStack. So Sean Roberts has been doing a lot of work here. And what we've done most recently and for the Juno timeframe is move it into its own repo so that, that people can focus on those reviews, get a separate core review team, um, so that people can really start to think what is, what is a training deliverable beyond just a manual. And so one of the things they're working on is, is a set of training lab, lab scripts. And the audience for those would be someone who wants to be a trainer and wants to be able to set up their own lab. So if we can collaborate and build those training scripts in the community, anybody could set up their own lab. Anybody could work on this at home. Anybody could work on this um, being able to do the exact commands that you would do on another, you know, on a private OpenStack Cloud on a public OpenStack Cloud. And so I think that's a really great reboot of this team to try to get them you know, really geared around deliverables that are slightly different, different from just the manuals, but deliverables that actually help people learn and teach and meet objectives that can then lead to passing tests about OpenStack. And then since Juno you know, is intended to be really this shift towards you know, how can we enable more and more app developers to consume OpenStack resources? Um, and like I said, last, last release we put together developer.openstack.org. Um, but what I want to do next, and it is pretty, pretty plain vanilla. It talks about the APIs, it talks about the SDKs, it talks about the CLIs. But what I really want to do next is, you know, let's make that site a true landing page for OpenStack developers. And by OpenStack developer, I do also mean the contributor developer. So you might have a landing page that says, do you want to make OpenStack or do you want to use OpenStack? And then they would have this entire embedded experience as a developer um, consuming OpenStack, using SDKs that we, are, we have known to be tested on OpenStack clouds. Um, and so part of that is going to be trying to get a simpler, simpler authoring um, style in there. You know, maybe, it's just a, maybe it's just an RST, Sphinx-based site. Maybe it's Markdown, um, Ruby, I don't know. But the idea would be, let's start enabling that entire entire group, hundreds of thousands of users, um, to to start writing documentation that helps each other. And you know, part of this is that we don't really have a developer experience program, and so I'm looking for governance ideas. And by governance, I mean, well, how do we get a core set of reviewers on those do those docs? How do we know that people know this works on the PHP SDK, or how do we test that this works on the Node.js uh, SDK. And so th that's where I'm really reaching out in the community and, and trying to find out what is the best way to stand up this true developer portal? How do we reach out 
to these developers on other languages beyond just Python. And then that always leads us to API documentation. Uh, we are maintaining the API definitions that that work across 12 projects, so we're probably up to probably 14 APIs because um, when you count the different versions that each um, project is putting out um, at any given time, yeah, I mean, Dolphin and Mark and McCall now, um, they, they have two versions of the API, version one and version two for the image service, and version two and version three for the identity service. So we're always working on those definitions, always working on the backlog of bugs, um, and also trying to put together this style guidance. So if you're an OpenStack developer or you're new to the OpenStack project, how do you know the best way to do marker limit all of the things that um, work that should work consistently consistently across the OpenStack APIs? So we're doing that as a, kind of a, a starting point document for the technical committee so that um, we can have a checklist for well, does it really meet what we originally thought was our style? Um, and let's talk about that some more. So. And then part of that work also, I mean, I think the style guide itself is probably a simple, you know, governance page, but also to put together an API guide that talks about the concepts across multiple APIs, the different use cases across multiple APIs. And then, I, you know, I can't say it enough, we always have bug fixing. I think there's 65 open bugs against Compute V2 API docs. So that is absolutely something we're constantly going, triaging doc bugs. Um, as we get more and more app developers, these guys are amazing at logging really detailed, really well thought out doc bugs. How can we keep improving the API documentation so that when someone goes to write an SDK implementation against our API, they know and can trust that API documentation. So lastly, and I think I'm right at 15 minutes. Sorry guys, but I cover a lot of stuff. <laughs> but how can you help? And, and I hope that some of you are here to um, figure out where you might fit in in the documentation program. Um, you can always connect with just me. I'm happy to be that first point of contact. I get on phone calls a lot. I talk to people all the time about their ideas, what can we do to implement those. Um, and you know, if you can't get directly in touch with me, I have a team that's always, a lot of people are always on IRC, and we have a pretty good mailing list where if you ask a question, we should be able to get back to you with an answer. I um, write a weekly to bi-weekly mailing list post that's so aptly named What's Up Doc. Um, I am sending out a monthly report to the OpenStack doc list that tells all the Google Analytics for the past month on the docs.openstack.org site. Um, we're also very, we have very talented developers who work on automation and talented developers working on our translation tool chain for the documentation specifically. So I am just always interested in looking for process improvements, looking for tooling enhancements, looking for um, how can we get higher and higher quality by being very um, persistent with our bug backlog, and always looking for new ideas and new contributors. So with that, I'll take questions. And of course, now it's open to anybody asking questions, correct? That's correct. Do we have any questions? No, we don't today, and that's okay. Uh, yeah, I want to thank Dolph, Mark, and Ann for being the first PTLs to conduct these series. Um, I, I just have a question. This is Margie. So in terms of developments towards Juno um, uh, beyond features, I know Mark, you had mentioned some things about import-export with interoperability and bug fixing. Do you guys see any other overall trends in terms of how things are, are changing from just upgradability and the overall projects outside of just features? Or is it just kind of ongoing extension from Icehouse, if that makes sense? I definitely think that now that we're able to document upgrades as we go, that's a definite improvement. Um, I just did a review today of the Havana to Ice House, and literally the day after Ice House released, we had people asking for upgrade documents, and we were able to get somebody writing on that right away. So to me, upgradability has made leaps in improvement. Okay. That's helpful. Well, great. Um, does anyone else have any questions? You, I can unmute people. Actually, be nice. You are now unmuted. Um, lines are unmuted. If anyone else has questions they want to ask of Dolph, Mark, or Anne. 
going. Okay. Well, feel free to email um, the foundation as well, and I can um, divvy that out to the respective um, person if you do have any questions, because I think you'll get a follow-up email after this call. But once again, I want to thank Dolph, Mark, and Ann for participating today. And this webinar will also be on YouTube probably within the next week, as well as several more webinars that are to come next week. So thanks, well, everyone. Thanks for having us. Thanks, Thank Allison. Thank you, Thanks, Margie. Mm -hmm. Thank you very Take much. Care. Sure. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.